8, we're going to read verses 1 through 3 and then get right into the, to the lesson here this, this evening. It says, Thus saith the Lord God, the, is, Thus hath the Lord God uh, showed unto me, and behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, A basket of summer fruit. Then said the Lord unto me, The end is come upon my people of Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. And the songs of the temple shall be howlings in that day, saith the Lord God. There shall be many de dead bodies in every place. They shall cast them forth with silence. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we ask God that you would guide and direct us. We look into your word the, this evening. We, we are so thankful for your book. We're thankful that uh, we have the Word of God in front of us. If we hold our King James 1611 authorized virgin, uh, Lord, we, we have exactly what you'd have us to have. It's not only given by inspiration, but kept by preservation. And, and Lord, we thank you for that. But what a privilege it is. We don't have to wait for a vision. We don't have to wait for a dream. We don't have to wait for a word from a prophet. Anytime during the day, we can crack open the book we can take a look down on its pages and see what thus saith the Lord any day of the week, any time of the day. Thank you, Lord, for that privilege. We pray as we study tonight that you'd enlighten our hearts and minds. We pray, Father, that the Spirit of God would lead us, guide us, and direct us for us in Jesus' name that we pray. All God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Verses 1 through 3, he's, he's, he's not saying that the end is coming. He's saying the end has come. He says, listen, I'm not passing by again. There's not going to be more warnings. This is it. This is the last time you're going to hear from me. And God, God used uh, a, a, a basket of, of uh, summer fruit to illustrate uh, the fact that the, the judgment was coming. Um, he often, oftentimes God uses the natural to illustrate the supernatural, and he uses the common to emphasize that which is, that which is spiritual. For instance, as an example, in uh, Jeremiah chapter 18, he talks about the potter and the clay, and he uses a uh, a potter with a potter's wheel and clay and uses it to illustrate what he's doing in, on Israel. It not only applies to Israel as a nation, also applies to individuals, all of us as individuals. In other words, God is sovereign and we're just clay on the wheel and, uh, and he can do with us as, as he sees fit. In Luke chapter 8, verses 11 through 15, he talks about the sower and the seed. And, uh, of course, the seed is the word of God, and the ground represents the various types of hearts. Uh, in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8, and Matthew 16, verses 6 and 11, he talks about leaven. He talks about the leaven of the Pharisees, and then he talks about leaven to the Corinthian church. And in both cases, he's talking about sin. And he's talking about how that, that uh, uh, sin is like leaven. Leaven is, is just another word for yeast. And when you take a little bit of yeast and put it in some dough, it ends up infiltrating all of the dough. Well, that's what sin does. When you put a little bit of sin in a person's life or a little bit of sin in a, in a situation, if it's not dealt with, it'll continue to grow. And, uh, and so he uses, he uses common things like that throughout Scripture. And in this particular case, he's using the fruit. The fruit was ripe, and it was ripe for eating just like Israel had become ripe for judgment. And in, in verse 3, um, look, look with me down in verse 3. It says, and the, the songs of the temple shall be howlings in that day. In other words... He's going to take songs of worship and songs of joy, and they're going to be turned. It won't be, it won't be a joyful time. It'll be a, it'll be a sorrowful time because it'll be howlings. And that word, that word howlings uh, means a, a, a loud cry or a mournful sound. 
I, you know, oftentimes when I think of howlings, I think of a coyote or a, a, a wolf. It's not, and, and that can be a, a mournful sound. But that's really what it is. When it comes out of a human being, it's just it's it's a, a sound of much sorrow. And uh, uh, you find uh, in verse in the rest of verse three, it says uh, there shall be many dead bodies to, in every place. They shall cast them forth with silence. So it starts with howling and it ends in silence because many people ended up getting slain. And this is speaking about the Assyrian uh, invasion and the, the Assyrian judgment that was about to come upon the nation of Israel and upon Judah. When I say Israel, I'm really being all-encompassing, but it was, both, it was both a message to Israel and to Judah at that time the kingdom was divided. In verses 4 through 6, he addresses the, the why. One of the, one of the big reasons, this isn't the only reason, but this is one of the big reasons why, uh, why the judgment was coming. Look in verse 4. It says, uh, Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail, saying, When will the new moon be gone, that we may sell corn, and the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances by deceit, that, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes, yea, and sell the, the refuse of the wheat. Um, what he's talking about here is covetousness. And covetousness had engulfed the nation of Israel and had overtaken the land. Um, take your Bibles and turn with me. Keep your finger here. Go to Colossians chapter 3. And if you underline or highlight your Bible, this is a good verse to underline and highlight. Colossians chapter 3. And look down with me in verse 5. Colossians 3, 5, I say that, and mine's not even highlighted or underlined, either one. It says, it says uh, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Now, what, he, what he's just simply saying is, is that God has been displaced. When, when covetousness comes into a life, then God ends up taking second or third or fourth place in that person's life because the covetousness overrules their affection for God. And that's why he says, uh, again, in Colossians, he says, uh, set your affection on things above, not on things on this earth. And the reason why covetousness sets in is because the two top priorities that we're supposed to love uh, cease to become the priorities. Jesus said over in Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40, he said that we should love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength. And then the second commandment is like unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself. As long as those two are in place, you're going to ward off covetousness. But if covetousness comes in, it's because both of those have started to wane. And if the first one starts to drop, the second one automatically starts to drop. You cannot properly love other people uh, like you should if you don't first love God the way, the way that you should. And uh, when, when uh, we get covetous, it's because we violated those two loves. And we've let something else take a hold of our affections instead of the love of God and then the love of others. Covetousness, I, I did a, years ago, I found myself jealous, envious, covetous, I mean, you just kind of roll them all up together, and uh, of a, a particular person in a particular situation. And I caught myself, and the Lord said, you know, you ought to see what I think of covetousness. And so I took the word covet, covetous and covetousness and just looked up and read every single verse that dealt with those. Whoa, God 
hates covetousness. And uh, because he, he knows what it does to the individual and he knows what it does to our relationship with him. And uh, covetousness is just dangerous and it's deadly. Uh, greatness in a nation does not come because a nation is capitalistic. You, you, you hear a lot of that uh, on conservative radio. You hear it on conservative news broadcasts. Uh, when you hear people that are uh, conservative, more right-wing type folks, they say one of, one of the big keys to a nation's greatness is capitalism. That is not true. That is not true. That is not the key. The key is loving God and loving others. Because if you, if you look at our, at our country, we're still a capitalistic country. Uh, as far as, you know, we're, we're quickly going to socialism, but, but primarily we were set up as a capitalistic country, and that works as long as the people are, are, uh, are, are not neck deep, deep in covetousness. And when, when the people as a whole become covetous, then that whole thing gets shot and it turns into greed. That's what happened with Israel. Israel had a capitalistic system. Okay, they had, they had freedom of enterprise, but they used it wrongly. And they used it to take advantage of people so that they personally could just get rich and could, could, uh, could increase their own goods. And uh, epi economic prosperity is, uh, is linked to a love and respect for God and others. And you've heard me say this often, uh, but the uh, respect that a, a country has for God, for the Bible, for one another, uh, makes a difference as to how that, what path that nation goes down. And right now we're going down a really, really dangerous path. And part of that is hooked to covetousness. You know, you hear folks, you know, say that, uh, you know, uh, uh, the big corporations have gotten greedy, and because they've gotten greedy, uh, we we need to uh, we need to, to to be careful because uh, uh, they they are running amok, and so we need to put clamps on on those folks. Well, that's not what the problem is. Uh, that's one of the reasons why they they say we need to go to socialism, but that's not what the problem is. The problem is people aren't loving God like they used to love God. They're not loving one another like they used to love one another. Michael Ann? Um, what's that verse? Uh, the love of money is the root of all evil. Uh-huh. I know, and then I was thinking, like, there's a lack of benevolence in charity. Like, real charity, not cheesy charity, like, go to the public economy and drop off your junk. But, like, the charity where you love others, like, Christ loves others through you kind of charity. And, and so if you're applying those two things, the love of the Lord and then the love of your neighbor, you are being benevolent, you are being charitable. That's why you're not loving things. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know you're going your your love's gonna go somewhere. <laughs> you know we we are we are made we are created as loving loving individuals, and so your love's gonna go somewhere. You need to direct it in the right direction. It needs to go first to God, and then secondly, it needs to go to others. And if it doesn't it doesn't go in those directions, the the whole thing's gonna be messed up. But be careful of this. You know, there's, there is a thinking out there that if, I think we get caught up in it sometime, that uh, if, if someone is conservative, then therefore they're going down the right road. Not if they don't have the love of God and the love for others. If they don't have that, even conservatism is going to end up the wrong place. And, uh, and what, what happens is, in fact, our, 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 whole, our whole government was, uh, was formed as a result of men getting down and seeking God on the thing. Um, you, you read stories about our founding fathers. It's amazing to me how our country was formed and how the, the uh, Declaration of Independence was written, how the Bill of Rights came about, how the Constitution came about. Uh, you know, what a blessing it is because God was integrally a part of the whole process. All right, as, as we continue down the road, we're going, we're putting God as less and less a part of the process. 
And when that happens, that's when you have some real problems and when you have some real difficulties uh, when it comes to, to a nation. And that's what had happened to Israel. They had gone down that road. And, and uh, look down in verse, uh, look down in verse 5. It says, saying, when will the new, new moon be gone that we may sell corn and the, the Sabbath that we may set forth wheat, uh, making the ephah small and the shekel great and falsifying the balances by deceit? They kept the Sabbath, but they did so begrudgingly. They couldn't wait for it to be over so they could go ahead and they could sell again. And so, so they were going through the outward motions, and again, they were caught in, a lot of this was just basically tradition. It wasn't coming from the heart. And uh, because, because of that, they ended up going down the wrong road and they ended up getting swallowed up, swallowed up in covetousness. They, uh, they falsified weights. Uh, they falsified measures in order to make more money. They, they uh, took advantage uh, uh, of uh, of people and enslaved people and, and sold inferior products. Uh, they took the, the pure wheat and they mixed it with the refuse wheat. That would be the chaff, that would be the stuff that fell on the floor, and they would, they would scoop that up, they'd put it all together, and then they'd sell it because that way they would get more money because they had more product. Uh, but the purity of the product was, was destroyed. So covetousness was really one of the main things because God brings this up over and over and over again in the book of Amos that they were, they were greedy and they were covetous. Then verses 7 through 14, it talks about the fact that the judgment's coming and basically, bottom line, you're not going to stop it. Uh, look in verse 7. It says, The Lord has sworn by the excellency of Jacob, surely I will, will never forget any of their works. Shall not the land tremble for this, and every one mourn that dwelleth therein? And it shall rise up holy as a flood, and it shall be cast out and drowned as by the flood of Egypt. And it came to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. And I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation, and I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins, and baldness upon every head, and I will make it as the, the morning of an only son, and the end thereof as a bitter day. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the, to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. In that day shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst. They that swear by the sin of Samaria and say, Thy God, O Dan, liveth, and the manner of Bathsheba liveth, or Beersheba liveth, even they shall fall and never rise up again. Uh, this, is, this is talking about the fact judgment's coming and, and you're not going to stop it. And, and he gives four pictures of the coming judgment. The first picture is found in verse 8. He says, Shall not the land tremble for this, and everyone mourn that, that dwelleth therein, and it shall rise up holy as a flood, and it shall be cast out and drowned as by the flood of Egypt. He use, uses natural disasters like floods and earthquakes. And it's interesting, uh, you, you go over to, you go back to Amos 1 in verse 1. Makes you wonder if he's referring to this as being the beginning of, of the judgment with the earthquake. It says, the words of, of Amos, who was among the herdmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. So there was an earthquake that was, that was coming. And uh, uh, he, he's, he's referring to that, and that, that could have been the, the beginning of judgment. Then the second picture he uses, down in verse 9, he says, And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth 
in the clear day. He's talking about darkness coming upon the earth. And what that was due to, we're not exactly sure. Um, it could have been God supernaturally brought in a day of darkness. Uh, it, 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 could, it could have been, uh, it, it could have been an eclipse, but according to what history says, the, the, um, the eclipse that did was supposed to take place did not coincide with the, with the judgment that came. So it was, it was at a, a totally different time. So it could have just been something supernatural that, that God just brought about rather than just prophesying the fact that it was going to happen. But the thing I want you to notice, and, and again, we see this a lot in the Old Testament. We see this a lot in Scripture, period, um, where, again, you have a, a double-sided meaning to the judgment. This is not only talking about the literal judgment that was going to eventually, in the near future, come upon Israel, but also the judgment to come that would take place during the tribulation period. And the key to that thing is a, is a particular phrase. Look down in verse 9 again. It says, and it shall come to pass in that day. When you find that day or the day or the day of the Lord, you'll find that he's not only referring to possibly an imminent judgment that's about to take place, but he's, it's, like I said, it's, got a, it's, got a, it's a two-sided, a double-edged sword, and it also has an implication of a, of a judgment that's coming. There, there are uh, many references in Scripture to a time of darkness on earth that's coming in the future. It has not occurred yet. And it's talking about the tribulation period. I want you to look with me at a few of those. Keep, keep, uh, you know, keep a, uh, a finger in Amos because we're going to be back there. But go with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 13. We'll do several of them just so you can see just how many references there are to this, this time during the tribulation period. Uh, Isaiah chapter 13 and look with me down in verse 10. Isaiah 13 and verse 10. Isaiah 13, 10 says, For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. In other words, they just go out. Well, what is that? That's, that's supernatural. That's God taking care of that thing. The sun shall be darkened and is going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Uh, go to chapter 24. And, and none of this has happened yet, so it's obviously looking toward the future. Um, Isaiah 24 and verse 23. 24, 23. Then the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. So be before he sets up his millennial reign, that's when this darkness is going to take place. Uh, go with me to chapter 34. And look down in verse 4. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree. You talk about a, a, a frightful time on the earth, and that's certainly going to be that, that time period. Uh, look with me over to chapter 60. Chapter 60, and look down in verse 2. It says, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness uh, the people. But the, the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And of course, that's again looking forward to that millennial reign. Um, go to Ezekiel chapter 32. Ezekiel 32. And look down in verse 7 and 8 with me. 32. 
verses 7 and 8. Verse 7 says that when I shall put thee out, I will cover the heaven and make the stars thereof dark. I will cover the, the sun with a cloud and the moon shall not give her light. All the bright lights of heaven will I, will I make dark over thee and set darkness upon thy land, saith the Lord God. Now I knew that there were uh, many references to this this occurrence in the tribulation period, but I didn't realize just how many of them there, there really were. Uh, go to the book of Joel, chapter 2, which we've already studied. Book of Joel. Joel, chapter 2, and verse 10. Joel 2, 10. It says, The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, and the sun and the moon shall be dark and the stars shall with, withdraw their shining. Uh, go down to verse uh, 31, same chapter. It says, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And that, that sounds very similar to what we're going to read here in just a little bit in the book of Revelation. Chapter 3 of the book of Joel, and look down in verse 15. It says, the sun and the moon shall be darkened and the stars shall withdraw their shining. You know, just in the same book, three different times, he makes reference to this incident that's going to take place in the future. So it's an important day. Uh, go to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24 is uh, a description that Jesus gives of the tribulation period. Matthew chapter 24. One of the, <clears throat> one of the, one of the things you got to be careful of is when somebody misappropriates Scripture, uh, takes Scripture and tries to apply something that is destined for the future and tries to either apply it to the past or apply it to the present where it does not apply. It's clearly a future reference. And that's Matthew 24 down in verse uh, 29, 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, and that's talking about the seven-year period, shall the, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the, of the heavens shall be shaken. Uh, there's also one in Luke 21, verses 25 through 26. Look with me there if you would. Matthew, Mark, Luke. 21, 25 and 26. Verse 25 says, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Can you imagine, you know, people, people are getting all bent out of shape today because of what they call global warming, which I think is just, just uh, uh, cycles that God puts the earth through. And plus, uh, some of what I think is happening in America and around the world is partly judgment. Uh, God uses weather to get our attention. He does that often. Can you imagine, I mean, if, if people are as frightened as they are today of some things, can you imagine what's going to happen when the lights go out? I mean, the stars quit, the, the, the uh, uh, moon turns to blood, the sun goes out. Uh, you, you know, that's like, like no terror, I don't think, that we've ever seen really on this earth before. Yeah. And think of how much more light. I'm just in a in a simple sense. I've been in a hospital a lot lately, so I'm excited to see people. Sorry if I share a lot tonight, but it's nice to talk to everybody. Um, it's just amazing to think that it's not just going to be physical light; it's going to be spiritual light. It's gone too. Like yeah. Oh yeah. 
Well, and, and obviously during the tribulation period, it's going to be, it's not only going to be dark physically, but it's going to be dark spiritually. And that was a, there was an, a, a, a certain segment of spiritual darkness that had already hit Israel during this time period that we're talking about because of the covetousness that came in, because of the immorality, the idolatry, and so forth. But, uh, but you, you go forward and you, you look ahead, you look and, and see, particularly, you just open your Bible between uh, Revelation, well, actually it starts in, verse, in chapter 6 as far as what goes on on the earth. <clears throat> you start in, in chapter 6 and you go to chapter 19. I'm telling you, it's terrifying stuff. Uh, you got things, you got creatures coming out of the center of the earth. You've got the, the sky darkening. You've got earthquakes. You've got plagues. You've got famine. And it's not just in little locales here and there like what we have seen over the years and over history. We're talking worldwide. Uh, you know, one of the things they're talking about right now is, and I, I don't remember in my life, maybe there was one, and I just, just was oblivious to it. That's a good possibility. Uh, but uh, uh, they, they, they talk about the fact that we're, that they think, I say they, the, the experts think that we're heading for a worldwide recession. And it does look like that, it really does. Uh, I'll be kind of surprised if that doesn't happen. They, they claim that in, if you look at the numbers, New York's already in it, uh, statewide, statewide. Um, but you, th you think about, about you know, the fact that the whole world is going through all of this stuff. This isn't just in one little locale. It's, it's going to be worldwide. Uh, take your Bibles and turn to Revelation 6. And aren't you glad you're not going to be here during it? Yeah, amen, me too. But what this does is this gives us motivation. I mean, not hell ought to be motivation enough for you to tell people about Jesus Christ. But it, not only are they, are they, are people, will be, people be heading for a godless hell, but they'll also be, they'll be heading toward tragedy and despair and terror like has never been on this earth before. It's Again, it has been in spots, but this is not spots. This is worldwide, and this is for, you know, one after another, after another, after another. Revelation 6, and down in verse 12, it says, And I beheld, when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, of hair and the uh, moon became as blood. Again, referring to that, that, that darkening of the sun and the moon and then eventually the stars as well. Look in chapter 8 and verse 12. Chapter 8 and verse 12. It says, And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So, so as the third part of them was darkened and the day shone not for a third part of it and the night likewise. So this is a, this is a darkness that's, we're gonna, that is going to take place in the future. But Israel was going to experience some momentary darkness uh, that has to do with the judgment that God was about to bring upon the nation and nothing was going to stop that judgment from coming. Uh, so he pictures the coming judgment as an earthquake and as floods, uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, earthly, earthly disruptions. He talks about darkness. And then in verse 10, going back to chapter 8 of, of Amos, verse 10, And I will turn your feasts into mourning, and all your songs into lamentation, and I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins, and baldness upon every head, and I will make it as the morning of an only son, and the end thereof as a bitter day. Now, what he just described is the way that people mourned over the death of a loved one. Uh, in this particular case, he's saying, he's saying this judgment's going to be like a one constant funeral, 
and it's going to be morning after morning because many of their, their own people are going to die. And then the last thing that he, he likens it to is a famine. In verse 11 down through 14, he says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord, and they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. In that day shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst. They that swear by the sin of Samaria and say, Thy God, O Dan, liveth, and the, the manner of Beersheba uh, liveth, even they shall fall and never rise up again. The thing I found interesting, and, and uh, I may have seen this before, but it really, really hit me as I was studying this passage. The famine is not of having the words of God. And really, most of the time when I read that, uh, I, what I was thinking when I was reading it, it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, and I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, not a famine for water, but a famine of hearing the words, uh, the words of the Lord. And I thought, well, they're not going to have the words of the Lord, so there's going to be a famine of the word of God. That isn't what it says. It says a famine of hearing the words of God. Uh, not necessarily not having it, but not hearing it. And in particular, you look down in verse 13, and the, the group that it's going to hurt probably the most is going to be the young people. In that day shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst, uh, because they, they have a famine of, of not hearing the word of God. In closing tonight, I want you to help me with something. What are some things that cause us to have a, uh, a famine of hearing the Word of God? In a society or as an individual, what causes a famine of not hearing God's word? What are some things that will cause that famine to occur? Jude. Like um, idolatry, uh, sin, like putting stuff before God. Okay. Idolatry. And when, when we say idolatry, you're talking about uh, Jude uh, folks uh, going down and bowing down and worshiping statues? That could be, okay. But is that always what idolatry is? What is it? It's like anything that you put before, before God. There you go. Like the Bible. Okay. Putting anything before God. Covetousness is as idolatry, okay? What is that? Well, it's because we put a desire before, we, before our love for God, okay? That will cause you, because your, your, your mind gets set on, on, on the wrong things, uh, particularly, and this is, of course, what's addressed in this book several times over, covetousness. Jesus said that uh, rich people will have a hard time entering into heaven. Why? Well, because they're covetous. Because they've got their, their mindset on the wrong things, and they can't hear uh, the things that they're supposed to hear. What else causes famine? Yes, sir? Pride. Okay, good. How does, how does pride... Cause a famine of hearing the word of God. Because you're saying that you're better than everything that is in the world. You're like, you're just better. You're just all powerful. And 
only listen to yourself. Yeah, I know best, right? I know best. I know what's right. Nobody needs to tell me what to do. Nobody needs to tell me what's right. It's what I think that counts, not what God thinks. And that's pride. And that will, that'll, that'll shut things off. That'll, that'll shut off your hearing just as quick as you can snap your fingers. Yes, sir. Okay, disobedience. Good. Why? Why does disobedience? Why does disobedience, uh, Titus, cause a famine of hearing the word of God? Uh, because God will think since we're not listening to Him before. Maybe. Makes the we Sometimes, if we don't listen to what He says, He quits talking. And we don't hear because he's not speaking to our hearts like he used to. Okay? Debbie? Lack of church attendance. If you aren't going to church, you're not listening to the word of God. Okay, there's a famine of the word of God if you refuse to hear it. And that can come in many different forms. A refusal to, to, uh, to hear... God's word okay and it could be refusing to go to church refusing to read your Bible etc uh, etc et this is Corey I think of the parable of the sower of seed and how it fell on different ground mm -hmm. so I think of what really chokes out the word for us is the cares that we carry we've got to look if we have the care those thorns come and they choke it out and we're not hearing anything and it's not nothing's prospering so the cares of this world can really or shall we just say overstimulation whatever you want to call it um, it can bring a lot of noise to the soul and at that point we can't hear anything but those cares and that noise I'm not about to pick at you I'm about to illustrate something okay Do you have some of that? You got a whole bunch of it. What is it that stops this from choking out that? What stops that? Yeah. What what is it that stops the cares of this world from getting in deafness of the word? Because we've all got them. We've all got them. Well, humility. Humility will stop that because that's what gives you grace. Okay. Uh, and that would go back up to the pride thing. It says humble yourselves. And Peter talks about humbling yourself first. You have to humble yourself and then you cast those cares. You can't cast the cares without humility. You have to know that God can take care of it. You have to trust him. Okay. Okay. That works. Anything else? Yeah. A lack of faith. Yeah. If the faith's not there, then... Uh, the cares are going to overcome. And uh, you put all that stuff together. And uh, if we don't respond properly, again, we've all got them. Uh, you know, the cares of this world. When, every time I read that, I think, well, who doesn't have that? Uh, you know, and some people obviously have more of that because there's more going on in their life than somebody else. And I understand that. But how do you prevent that? Well, the, I, I think there's... You know, there, there's many things. One of them is stay humble. Uh, another one, what was the one you just said? Just the lack of faith. Faith. The lack of faith. If, if you have faith, that'll overcome that. Uh, the other thing is just spending time thinking on the Word of God. Spend time meditating on the Word of God. Um, part of the problem is if... if and we all have them, okay? We all have cares of this world. But if we spend more time thinking about this than we do about that, then this is going to overcome us. This is going to overtake us. And it, it consumes our very being. And that's when we get in trouble. Okay, anything else? Hey, you guys are really hopping tonight. Yes, sir, Titus. Uh, when you don't pray, God will choose not to answer back. Okay, 
Uh, prayerlessness is another one. And I'm going to quit writing them down at this point. I'll just let you guys spit them out. Prayerlessness. Jude. Anger at God. Okay, any kind of emotional anger, bitterness, malice, uh, unforgiveness, any of that kind of stuff will cause you to start become hard of hearing. Um, I've, I, you know, I've, I've seen it. I've not only seen it, I've gone through it myself personally. Uh, when, I have, when I have had uh, an issue of bitterness, when I have had an issue of anger, uh, God may be screaming in my ears and I can't even hear it because my ears are plugged, <laughs> spiritually speaking. And uh, uh, any of those... Well, take, take your Bibles. Go to Ephesians. Go to Ephesians 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Look in verse 30. It says, And grieve not the, the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking uh, be put away uh, from you with all malice. Even getting involved in gossip, uh, saying the wrong things will get your mind in the wrong place and you will not, you will impair your hearing of the word of God. Um, have, you, have you ever done this? Have you ever, I, I've, I've seen this happen. I've seen this happen in church services where uh, two different people will be in the same service. And one person will walk out of the service and say, well, man, I didn't get anything out of that. That was a total waste of time. And another person who's just sitting across the aisle walks out and says, man, God really spoke to my heart. I'm telling you. Now, I realize you can be in, in different uh, stages and it might not necessarily be a deafness of the word of God. It's just that it just didn't hit you like it hit somebody else. But when you're, when you're walking out with an attitude and saying, well, man, I didn't get anything out of that. What in the world was that all about? There's something wrong. There's something wrong. And, I, and again, I've seen it happen to really good folks. You know, uh, some of you say, well, I, I didn't get anything out of that message. And I'm coming out of that message saying, whoa, I, I, you know, Lord really spoke to my heart about some things. Well, uh, when you've got things going on on the inside that are wrong, you got the, the wrath, the anger, the bitterness, the unforgiveness, whatever, uh, it, it deafens the ears and it, it causes our ears to get plugged. Uh, the other things that I added to that was, uh, well, go with me to uh, Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24. And this verse explains a lot about what's, what the atmosphere is going to be like uh, during the tribulation period. Matthew chapter 24, and look in verse 12. And this, this chapter deals with the tribulation period coming up. And it, it says in verse verse. Uh, uh, verse 12, it says, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. People's love, love for God, love for others, it's going to be affected. Why? Because of iniquity. And as iniquity uh, rises in a society, then love diminishes in a society. I've seen that over my lifetime in America. I have seen iniquity rise and love diminish. Um, I really believe in, in, in a lot of ways the 2020 election was won by one and lost by another due to a dislike and in many cases a real strong hatred 
for one of the uh, one of the presidential candidates, and and I think it I think votes were cast on both sides because of not just I like this guy, but is I can't stand this guy. I hate this guy. And yeah, I've heard a lot of that. I've heard a lot of it from both sides. I hate so and so. I hate I hate I hate this candidate. I hate that kid. Man. We can't run a country like that. And when a country starts going in that direction and they become more hate motivated than they are love motivated, then you got some real problems. And what that indicates is that there's a, a famine. And it's a famine not of having the word of God. Folks, we can get, we can get a hold of the Bible. Yeah, you used to say, you, I used to make the comment, you know, you could just go get a dime store Bible or a, a and you used to be able to, I don't know if they still have them, a dollar store Bible. Uh, you can't hardly read it. You need a magnifying glass, but, uh, but, but you can get it. So it's not like, not like people don't have it. And now you can, get on the, you can get on the internet and get it for nothing. I mean, get it for free. Get, I, you know, I, I, I listen to it every day. Not, not only read it, but read it and listen to it at the same time. Um, so it's, it, it's in abundance. The word of God is there, but there's a famine of hearing it. Famine of hearing it. Any questions or comments, thoughts before we go to prayer here tonight? Yes, Michael Ann. Yep. Yep. Um, like I said, I've I've not seen um, I've not seen the, the the atmosphere be like what it is today in my whole lifetime. It's never been as opposing and as uh, full of friction as what what you see today, and it's because of iniquity. Iniquity. <laughs> Sin never does any individual favors. It never does a family any favors. It never does a church any favors. It never does a nation any favors. And as, as sin abounds, then that, that love starts to wax colder and colder. And you just, you see it. It's, a, it's an atmospheric, uh, an emotionally atmospheric condition in a, in a society. Any others? Questions, comments? Okay, get out your get out your prayer list if you would. I'm going to have you go to the Lord in prayer as uh, find yourself a partner or two and and uh, spend some time in prayer together. And then when when you're done praying in here, then you're you're free. That you're dismissed. Um, remember to uh, pray for uh, Mrs. Cameron. She has uh, shingles, so continue to pray for her. Also pray for the, the John Marshall family over in Toledo, lost their home. Uh, man, I'm, I'm excited about uh, the good testimony. You could tell he was heartbroken in the, in the video, but you could also tell he had a good spirit about him. And that, 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 that's, a, that's a very, very strong testimony in that community. And then pray for Dan Corey. Uh, he's tonight. He's working a double shift. When does he get off? Um, yeah, sure. Um, he's going to get off work on Friday. Oh, huh? Well, he's going to no, no. When does he get off tonight? Twelve p.m. At twelve twelve o'clock tonight. Okay, then he comes home. Right? Okay. <laughs> okay. Then he has like five hours of sleep. He pardon? Okay, he's only had five hours of sleep? Yeah. Okay. So anyway, uh, it says, uh, pray for Dan. He's had a double shift today, and he's getting a double shift tomorrow. And uh, pray that uh, he'll uh, stay alert uh, while he drives uh, from work and while at work. Uh, he's, you know, being working in a prison is, is, can be a precarious job at times. So, uh, so be in prayer for him, if you would. 
All right, find yourself a uh, prayer partner. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Let me encourage you also, too, to pick some of our missionaries tonight and specifically pray for uh, some of our missionaries, if not all of our missionaries. Uh, we've got a bunch of them, and uh, just like we go through struggles, they do too, but they're doing so in a foreign land with sometimes a whole lot less friends than what we have and a whole lot less support. So uh, be in prayer for them as well. Let's go to Lord in prayer.